All right, guys, today is the day I get to talk to my brother. Not just my brother, but he's also my boss. All right. All right. <laughs> he's also my boss. So, hey, welcome, Sean, to uh, Planning Free Life. Um, it's an honor just to be here with you. And, uh, man, I think we've been knowing each other uh, on and off for like four or five years. Yeah. It's one of those, like, um, one of those things that. This is a bad analogy, but for the people that don't know, this is eight o'clock in the morning, so my mind's kind of loopy. But I'm gonna say it anyway. It's like a, a, a like like dating, right? Like yeah. we we keep on missing each other. That's right. <laughs> you're doing something, and then and then when I'm busy, and then when when you're busy, I'm doing something, and we just never get to. But for the past two years, you've been walking with me and journeying with me. And supporting me to yeah. plant this new church that God has given us. So we're going to talk about this. So why don't you introduce yeah. yourself and yeah. let's get going. So I'm Sean Fenner. I'm a pastor here at Light Life Church. We're in a team model right now. So we've been in a transition um, from an apostolic, uh, Larius planting, visionary kind of church. Um, planted multiple churches, a couple dozen churches in our area. Um, sent out, man, we just sent out our 69th leader in wow. the full-time ministry. Wow. And so um, just been in this river vision. We'll talk a little bit about what a river vision is, um, but we're in this transition and and we see the future of the church as team leadership. And so as Joel and I think about the future, we think about co-pastoring, we think about um, support and accountability. Um, that really comes from an ax type of model uh, that we believe will help us continue to multiply and even grow the river beyond what it's been before. So we're excited, man. I'm ready to step into this season fully. Yeah, yeah. And Sean's just been a great brother and and a mentor, not just to me, but for a lot of young leaders. We're going to talk about two yeah. emerging ethnic leaders. And, yeah. and I know he's passionate about that. But why don't you tell listeners about something about yourself and yeah. how you came to uh, Christ a little bit? Like yeah. one minute, because <laughs> yeah. we want to get to the other stuff. No, but I feel you, man. I got to light life and all that good stuff. Yeah, man. So I actually, um, you know, grew up in a really broken family, not a Christian household. And then um, when I was young, I, I was taken away from my mom, mm. sent to live with my grandma, and she looked for a private school. She ended up finding light in life. This is early on in Larry's ministry when the church was growing and diversifying. So I was young, like kindergarten age, come to light in life. Um, the, the gospel is planted as a seed in my heart. And then straight out into the world, you know, came back to um, living with my mom and was arrested when I was young, just, you know, went through some really tough stuff and then really came to the end of that rope, right, um, in my early 20s and found myself back here at Light and Life. And um, really, it was crazy, like almost, you know, felt like audibly in my, my head, I was hearing God say, come back home. And so it was an opportunity for me to come back here. We tried different churches, look for different places, but you know how it is, man. When you find home, you find home. That's right. And so... Uh, came back and just started volunteering again, serving. I was working in insurance at the time, um, and God called me into ministry. Larry and I were actually in the Philippines wow. doing ministry together, and um, he offered me to be his assistant at a Starbucks in the Mall of Asia. Um, and I think, you know, no money, nothing like that. And I thought, God, I'm giving myself over to poverty for the rest of my life. Wow. And uh, quit my job, came on staff at Light and Life, then became the youth pastor, executive pastor. Um, and now in this lead role. So I'm super excited. That's about what crazy. God's doing, man. That's crazy. Man, while you were talking, I was just thinking about how did I start in ministry? I mean, my grandma and my dad's a pastor, and I, you know, yeah. I worked for them, right? <laughs> I worked for the family business, but outside of that, like real vocational ministry, I was, uh, I just got out of jail for doing something dumb, went back to school, and I was, I was at a Korean mall eating lunch. Same thing a pastor said. And that's when I got wow. into ministry, not multicultural ministry just ministry in general yeah. somebody gave me a shot i was barely going back to school i was like 28 you know and uh he said paul you want to come work for me real quick and i was like in the middle of eating noodles and i was like what wow. <laughs> after sharing my story and i was like wow so it's crazy how god calls us he yeah. called you in the philippines and bro what he can Beach. do over a meal right yeah <laughs> like, come on Meals man. are. I mean, we want to talk about that too how food is connected to all this that's as well that's right that's right youth ministry yeah this is how i got to know uh your name and i'm gonna I'm be a little bit real when uh, our mutual friend says, hey, why don't you talk to my buddy, Sean? Uh, and I was like, all right. I didn't know who you were because I was just getting in the game myself. Yeah. And 
we shouldn't call it a game, but sometimes it sort of feels like. But right. we were getting the ministry, and I was getting to know other leaders and and partners. And obviously, you know, if you're in an old school denominational, you don't really get yeah. to know what's outside the box. That's right. And that's a challenge for yeah. denominations that it's exposing now, especially yeah. now. It is. And so, uh, because the ministry that God has plant uh, given my heart was outside, yeah. multicultural, diversity. Um, he said, "Why don't you meet my friend Sean Fenner?" And I was like, "Who's this Sean Fenner guy? I don't yeah. know." And then I looked online and I was like, oh, my God, this guy's pretty big time, dude. Oh, and I was wow. like, this is cool. And so I saw you some clips of you doing UIWI yeah. on the stage. At that time, you were preaching more than hosting now That's not right. that you were doing. Yeah. Um, and so I got to know you. And the first thing that, that we met, I think the, the most memorable moments we had was just long talks of Jesus. No mm-hmm. ministry, yeah. no nothing. That's and it. that's the heart that I was looking for in partnership. Yeah. And so youth ministry, yeah. you were, I mean, talk to me about that. You know, yeah. how did you get involved with that and some of the stuff that you did, you know? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, my heart for youth ministry really initially came out of um, not seeing in my community what I needed when I was young. You know, it was this recognition of like, I was sitting there thinking like, man, when I was young, had I had someone that was passionate like me, I think things would have worked out differently for me. Wow. And so as I read through the gospel and I really began to understand like the Great Commission, I recognized that discipleship is meant to happen life on life, right? right. Um, that it's meant to happen in a, in a very uh, holistic, fruitful way. Um, and so honestly, bro, like, like initially where it started, it didn't even have structure. It just started around like, hey, anytime I do something... Yeah. I'm going to have a young dude with me. That's right. Anytime I do, like go to the bank, grab groceries, uh, buy diapers for my kid, like anything, I'm always going to have someone with me. And so I, I dedicated my life in ministry around never being alone. And that came out of Luke 10. You know, I read Jesus sent them out two by two. That's right. right. And so I'm thinking to myself, man, if I could always have somebody with me, then I can always be training up and discipling. Mm. And I'll never forget the commission of being a witness to the gospel, right? That that Acts 1-8, right? Now you're going to go be my witness to the ends of the earth. And so that's really where it started. And then out of there, it began to develop structure. And I think initially where, where it began to develop structure and where I began to multiply leaders um, and really began to plant, we actually planted seven youth ministries out of our youth ministry. And so it was the first time, I think, where a ministry of light and life had planted something new. Now, Light and Life had been planting, right? And being a, a river church, planting new churches. But I'd never seen like a children's ministry or a young adult ministry plant another ministry. And so uh, we actually, the first time, had leaders come for six months and sit under us, learn and grow. And then they took some of our kids with them, their families. And so they actually planted a Spanish church out of our youth group. And then God was like, Sean, you could do this again. And you could help raise up youth groups for a generation that's walking away from the church. And so my my biggest realization, I think, was one night I was at youth group and um, I, I was I was preaching and, and leading and we had gathered like 200 young people, right? It was crazy, like felt good, packed out room, all that. Um, and then the next week I was flying to Florida to do a teaching. And uh, I flew to Florida and set my team up. Everybody's good, all that. And like 30 kids showed up that week while I was gone. And I had this realization. I was with my mentor, Larry Acosta. And uh, Larry said to me, he said, yeah, man, that's because you built your youth ministry around you, not around empowering youth. Mm. And so like, bro, I- That's a free lesson, y'all, for the leaders out there. I think it was like one o'clock in the morning in Florida. You know, I'm like restructuring my mindset for ministry. I can just picture you like crying in your hotel room. I'm sitting there like, God, help me. Like, it's not about you, Jesus. It's all about me, you know? Um, Uh, And here I am sitting there thinking like, man, you know what would be even more powerful is if I could train up 12 people to lead without me. Wow. And I realized like, wait, that's biblical. That's exactly what Jesus did. In Acts, right, you see Jesus coming out of Luke in this glorified body. He sits with them for 40 days. And then he says, now I'm going to send the spirit to empower you and you're going to do it on your own. Mm. And I'm like, why am I not doing this? This is a biblical model of empowering the church. And so I just created spaces for them to begin to lead without me. Um, And then I, I created a table of 12. 
Mm. And that's really how it started. And then we began to multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. So, um, you know, being a being a church that was always planning, we always had older people because young people get excited. They go. Um, now, not only do we have a fruitful youth ministry, but bro, I was running small groups. We started to celebrate recovery ministry out of our, our youth group. Um, it launched our young adults group at the church and, and really grew to now our church being predominantly probably under 30. I mean, if you look at our congregation, um, and then my original group of 12 that I sat with, five of those guys are actually in ministry now Mm. and serving the church. And so it was this recognition of like, Hey, it's not about me. It has nothing to do with me. Ministry is not about you. It's all about Jesus. That's it. And I know Paul, that's like your bread and (laughs) butter, bro. That's like your bread and butter. Like it's all about Jesus. Like stop with the fluff, stop with the other stuff. But really, honestly, if you can teach people to live on mission for God and what God's commandments are um, and help them learn to baptize other people, um, that's how the kingdom of God is going to grow. So let, let me give you guys a little analogy, man, of, of how I raise leaders up. So my wife, every holiday season, um, she makes this bomb apple cider. It's like ridiculous, right? So she got like this crock pot. This sucker sits in there for like a day and a half. Wow. She puts like, you know, orange zest and cinnamon and like... All, actually, I can't tell everybody all that's on that because I can't give away the secret. Yeah. My wife might be upset. Next thing you know, I'm going to be bringing apple cider to the next Man, staff meeting. I'm like, what's going like, on? What's this taste? What's it's kind of similar. Taste, bro. And, and I'm, so I'm selling it. <laughs> my family, bro, from Thanksgiving to Christmas is like sipping on cider. Like straight up, that's how it works. Mm. Um, and when I think of raising up young leaders, I really think of the word cider. Mm. Um, and what I mean by that is it takes time. And it has specific ingredients and so let me just break it down real quick so so the word cider right context you have to help people understand their context if young people don't understand what they've been called to they won't live for jesus Mm. and what do i mean by that is we we often will either militarize the gospel or we will send people into something they were never called to and so helping young people understand their context who they are what they've been called to helps them understand what their mission field is for the gospel. So you talk about going and making disciples. The problem is, is that if you're in a barren place, how are you going to be called to the mission field? Mm. If you're in a barren place and you're yourself not producing fruit and bringing life where you are, how are you stepping into the harvest field? Let me give you an example. Um, My sister-in-law, we adopted her. She came to live with us and crazy story, like literally um, baptizing young men on the, on the beach and and God says, go get her. And we went like clothes soaking wet and signed custody. Pay. It was crazy, bro. Like <laughs> crazy. Um, and God brings her into our home and she really wanted to be a Biola. Mm. Um, and she didn't make the music program. Mm. And she felt very defeated. And she felt like she was missing her mission. But what I was reminding her of was her context. So we ended up at LBCC. She mm. was going to do the promise program, right? right? And so we ended up at LBCC. Bro, I get a flat tire in the parking lot. We're sitting at LBCC. And I start praying, God. What do you want to do through Kimmy here at LBCC? Mm. She comes out frustrated. She's meeting with the uh, the student board. She's like, man, I'll finish it up here. And then, you know, it'll be a couple years till I get where I really want to be. And I told her, you're telling me that God can't use you right where you are. Mm. This is your Jerusalem. Mm. Remember Jerusalem, yeah. Judea, Samaria right. to the ends of the earth. That's right. I said, God wants to use you right where you are. So we began to prayer walk. And God gave her vision to start a ministry there. So we partnered with one of my friends who runs InterVarsity. Mm-hmm. And with just four hours a week, Bo and I helped Kimmy plan a ministry that reached over 300 people with the gospel Amazing. over just a couple of years. And bro, you know what I found out? I found out that everybody was trying to go to four-year universities. <laughs> and there were 36,000 students at a community college. Why? Because people didn't understand their context. That's right. And so it was easy for me because now... Kimmy understood her context and she knew what her mission field was. So it's not just enough to understand your context, but then you need to be doing identification, Mm. right? For me, I'm always looking at what is your potential? When I look at people, I see like, man, you're good at this. You're good at this. You're good at this. You're good at this. Unfortunately, we live in a world right now where the church is often trying to teach young people to grow in their weakness rather than live in their gifting. Mm. And it's dangerous because people have been given very specific gifts. And so when I see somebody that's good at music, you know what I do? I teach them how to worship. 
when I see somebody that's good at convincing other people, teach them apologetics. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So you take their their gifting, you identify what's strong about them. Mm. And not that we don't need to grow in our weaknesses, but right. asking people to lead out of their weaknesses is not what Jesus asked people to do, mm. right? Even Peter, Peter, headstrong, steadfast, right? becomes this rock that Jesus is going to build the church on because he grew him out of what was his strength but misunderstood and misused. He helped him identify it, built it up, and now built something out of it, right? And so that's what I want to do. I want to find things in people and build something out of it. And then once you identify them, you begin the process of development, right? You you give them opportunities to affect change. And so here's the danger is that... um Every servant is not a leader, but every leader is a servant. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so initially what I do with every young person, Paul, that wants to lead another young person is I give them an opportunity to serve. Mm. You want the platform? First, you got to put the chairs away. That's right. You want a stage? You got to go plant trees. Mm -hmm. You you want to see God use your words? Then go paint a house. And so what we were about in our youth group was about service opportunities. Mm. I, I'll tell this super quick story. I remember this young kid, Matthew, right? Came to our youth group. God was really using him. Rough kid, right? I, I met him at Poly High School. And um, in one of my sermons while I was preaching, uh, he, he like cussed in the middle of the service, right? And he's like, F, yeah, like say that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this kid's like straight off the street, bro. Like <laughs> he's excited and yeah. doesn't even know how to express his excitement. <laughs> yeah. And God had started working on him. And one thing I realized was he was really good at using his hands. Mm. And so we had an opportunity to plant 300 trees down Cherry Avenue. And I said, hey, dude, here's your opportunity. You're going to gather 12 guys and you're going to show me the leader that you really are. I'm going to give you an opportunity to be developed into the leader I know you are. But bro, I didn't give him a sermon to preach. He wasn't trained in that, but I knew that using his hands could speak life into other people. So we planted 300 trees all the way down Cherry Avenue. Wow. A couple of weeks later, I'm in the car and I'm getting ready to pull up to the stoplight and he's walking with a couple of his boys. They're walking up the street and homeboy like drops a Taki's bag like (laughs) on the street, like literal, like, you know, just kids, bro. They're littering. And dude, he stops. I'm watching this happen from the car. No influence. No nothing, right? He looks at his boy and he's like, hey, pick that up right now. (laughs) And the dude picks it up and he's like, yo, this is my neighborhood. Yeah, I'm invested in this because now he had made a difference in his community. And what happened? He became a community leader. Wow. And now he was setting the tone and example. So if you want to develop leaders, you've got to give them opportunities to serve. Bro, for too long, we've thought that we would raise up a generation of leaders by having them sit in seats, Paul. It's not going to work. The church is not going to be built from people sitting on the gifting that God has given them. That's right. When I worked myself out of youth ministry was the night that I realized, man, my leaders were just as good at everything I had done that Mm. I was. Mm. I had 40 leaders at the time leading. I mean, from... Meeting parents in the parking lot to serving pizza to gathering information to flipping lights to sound to preaching. Bro, and literally one night I just came and I'm like, there's nothing for me to do. And so I recognized that I had created consistency and helped them learn adaptability. Hmm. One one of the greatest strengths, you know, um, expectation of leaders in, in growing, that's the E insider. Um, is expect to teach people to be adaptable. Mm. That's what this generation needs. You know, you know what's happening to the church right now. The church is dying right now because of a virus that hasn't allowed us to meet in person. <laughs> so you're telling me that in China the church is thriving and they can't meet in buildings, but in America because we couldn't meet in buildings for eleven months, the church is dying. Wow. We haven't taught adaptability. We haven't taught people to shift their method so that they can lead other people, right? And so now I'm watching people use Zoom, go online, do all this stuff. Man, we were one of the first people to close our building doors, but we were also one of the the first people to capitalize on the growth of adaptability. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always expecting adaptability out of them. And then I think the last thing, the R, if we're thinking about this like cider method, letting it sit kind of method, is you have to be able to redirect. Mm. As a leader, bro, you cannot be afraid of conflict. Can I just let that sit and simmer for a second? (laughs) Too many leaders in the church are afraid to call sin, sin. 
Too many leaders in the church are afraid to address conflict. And the writer of Hebrews says this, it becomes bitterness in people's hearts. Bro, one thing about me is there are going to be times where we don't understand each other. Mm. There are going to be times where we don't agree about things. But my heart is always to address conflict so that conflict doesn't become anger, resentment, fear, anxiety, bitterness. And I remind my leaders, listen, you're not always going to like what I say, but you're going to know I love you by what I say. That's right. So I'm always avoiding statements. You know, I hear this with young people, like especially parents, man. It's like, you always, yeah, you always, you always mess up. You know, yeah. um, I, I ask questions like, what do you think? Mm. How did that make you feel? Mm. How does how does failure sit with you? You know, the, the reality is that we don't let people fail, Paul. Mm. And so we don't let people learn. Man, if you look at the disciples, bro, tell me the disciples did not fail. <laughs> like name one. Yeah. Come on, man. They, they, they failed constantly. I mean, even John, who was the beloved of Christ, him and his brother walk into a town and he's like, God, kill them all. Yeah. You know, redirection. Right. Hey, man, no, that's not the right mindset. That's right. And then you just walk through this process. You let this sit and mm-hmm. simmer. And then, bro, I'm telling you, you're going to be drinking something beautiful. Mm, that's good. As people grow in Christ. That's how, I, that's how I really learned to develop young leaders. And what's crazy about that is now... Um, my heart out of being a disciple that makes disciples is that the disciples that I made have made new disciples. Mm. I always tell, um, young leaders that come to me, they go, when do you know that you're done making a disciple? Uh, Alexander James, he yeah. came to me and said, when do you know you're done making a disciple? I said, when your disciples made a disciple, that's right. If a sheep cannot reproduce, you've not lived out the commission mm-hmm. or the commandment. And the reality is this. What, what did God say to Adam and Eve in the beginning? Be fruitful and, and multiply. multiply. That's right. That's our call through That's Jesus. Right. Go and make disciples of every nation, teaching them to obey me. What is the commandment to mm. make new disciples? So here's the thing is, if you are making barren leaders, you're not making leaders, you're making minions. Mm. You're making copies of yourself. I'm not looking to make copies of myself. I'm looking to empower people to do what God wants them to do. And that is to raise up other people for the glory of God. Mm. So I'm always looking like, are you barren or are you producing fruit? Mm. Are you barren or is leadership growing out of your leadership? Are you barren or am I seeing disciples be made out of disciples? Because listen, we're not shepherds if our sheep don't reproduce. Mm, And so that's what I sit in is that's the cider method wow. i don't know man maybe that's good maybe yeah. i need to like copyright that yeah or something. write a book i mean I, I just felt like i just sat through a whole session and i'm supposed to be interviewing this guy but Come i'm just on, learning man. you know this is one of the reasons why i love talking to you because everything you do i can i know where it's coming from right and it's coming from the bible right um and as bible believing brothers and for the church that's our standard yeah and we didn't write it that's right the perfect Paul. god wrote it that's right and so even as we struggle yeah. to follow yep if we can do our best to follow that mm-hmm. and emulate that and display that that's going to show the people that we love them because yeah. it's not by our own strength it's by yeah. the grace of god that we're allowed to do this right yeah. <laughs> we're allowed to do this right yeah um and so raising up leaders and as you were talking like how important it how important is it same way as I was doing youth ministry is just people just sitting with you. I mean, that's what the disciples did for that's three right. years and they still messed it up, they right? Still I was just messed it up. You know, and then we, we talk about Peter's public denial. We talk about the doubt of Thomas. We talk about the betrayal of Judas. Yeah. They still and they had the Messiah right there next that's to them eating, bro. you know, at the party. So why are you upset when you, <laughs> you know fail I mean? in discipling people? Yeah. Jesus himself, he didn't fail at it. Right. But right. they failed that's in right. following. That's right. And so as a leader, like you're going to have times, man, where you're really disappointed in people. That's right. But recognize that, man, God's also been really disappointed in you at times. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Because <laughs> we got some, yeah. Come on, uh, man. This disappointment right now. You know what I mean? Of some right. leaders. That's right. You know, when you talked about adaptability, and I want to get into this because this is a multi-ethnic church. Yep. Um, ethnic people are really good at adapting. That's right. Ethnic communities. I mean, That's obviously... Right. Let's be real. 
this is not our land, right? Mm -mm. We came here for whatever reasons. It could be for religious freedom, yep. safe haven, That's right. financial opportunity, whatever it is. Because, yeah. because America had the opportunity to do that. We came and made it happen mm. the, way we're the way we were able to yeah. under the law. <laughs> but we made it happen. Right. Um, and so how do you think that transfers and what have you seen in the rise of ethnic leaders? Because yeah. now you see biracial couples, yep. interracial kids. Yep. What is a, what is the American church? I don't know, man. Yeah. You know, and as, as, I, as I'm planting out, you know, the model that we're trying to do is multi-ethnic, multicultural and multilingual, mm. adding and bridging and bringing in the first gen yeah. to not. We're not serving the first gen anymore, hmm. but we're trying to flip it to where. They're, they're going to empower us, that's right? And, and that's tough to do. It is. But that's the reality that we live in. Yeah. I mean, the, the city that I live in at one point was 85 Anglo, 85 white. Yeah. And now it's like, I don't know, 20%. You know what I mean? So yeah. I don't know. In your mind, when you think about church and leadership and emerging leaders, what are you thinking about? Yeah, so I think, you know, where, where I would start, Paul, is I think um, the... The church has done a really bad job of separating ethnicity and culture. Um, we think it's the same thing. And so, um, bro, you could have a, a black person uh, who grew up really different than another black come person. Come on, come on. You could have a white person who grew up really different than another white person. And so I think for me, you know, first of all, it's recognizing the difference of both, but yet the importance of both, right? right. So... Um, sometimes it's a ethnic rediscovery. Um, sometimes it's putting down the baggage that comes along with your ethnicity. So every every ethnicity and culture both come with both baggage and blessing, right? Um, and and you have to deal with those things. You have to learn to deal with those things. I, I think of like um, you know we always talk about soaring and flying and rising to new heights in the kingdom. Well, you know on airplanes they let you take two bags, and so in life. You've got your culture yeah. and you've got your ethnicity and you got to deal with what's in both. Mm. You really do. Or or sometimes it's it's not going to make the weight. Sometimes um, there's something in there that shouldn't be in there. And so I think separating them and understanding the difference and then learning how to celebrate them well, mm. right? Um, you know, there there's this, um, man, it, it's, a, it's really hard. I got to be really careful how I say it, but I'll just say it how I think and, and then... You can cover my sin later. Um, but, you know, I, I think of like there's this whitewashing that happens in the church. Um, and so you can have a very multi-ethnic church, but a single single culture church. That's right. right? And, and generally, um, ethnic minority leaders have had to adapt simply because if they don't, they're not allowed in the, in the, um, the club. Mm -hmm. And so in church... What we've taught young ethnic leaders is act like white people. And that's really dangerous for the kingdom because it's not Revelation 7. That's right. You know, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. So when you strip people of their tongue, right, um, you strip people of their worship. You strip people of their opportunity uh, to, to praise God the way God has called them to praise. It's part of the reason I love your model. And, and I know you talk a lot about that. I'm excited about your model and what God is doing in that. But you do have to understand the difference. So a first generation Latino and a third generation Latino are very different. You know, the, you have a second, third generation um, Latino. So second and third are different. Oh, bro, you know I mean? who, who <laughs> might not even speak their native tongue. Right. And so there's some rediscovery that might need to happen, but there's also a learning that needs to happen from the other generations. And so I think healthy churches are three things. They're, they're multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational mm -hmm. because that's how I think you find balance in that. Um, and you learn to celebrate the blessing and deal with the baggage that comes along with it. And so um, for me, you know, one, one thing I would do is I would be really careful with my young ethnic leaders to stand, understand their starting point, right? Their starting point is not always the same, um, even if they grew up in the same culture. So like if I have a an Asian and a white leader, 
their starting point is not the same, right. even if they grew up in the same culture. Right. And so I have to recognize that, right, and learn to value people that have had setbacks or haven't been set up. Mm -hmm. um, not that I would play favoritism, right, but I would cater to the gift mix, cater to the culture, cater to the ethnicity, cater to the reality of the situation. Um, and, and this is what I would say to people is like, you know, Jesus had his three, right? Peter, James, and John. Um, does that mean that God plays favorites? Mm. I'm not sure, but I do know this. I know that Jesus knew they needed extra time. Mm -hmm. They needed extra energy. They needed something different than the other disciples needed. And then the 12 needed more than the 72 and the 72 more than the 500. What You know, you go all the way down in that. And so it's understanding that there are specific needs based on experiences that people have been through. Their ethnic identity has been shaping their journey along the way. Um, but I would also caution, and I'll let you speak into this a little bit more. You know, I'm, I'm biracial, but perceived white. Right. Um, you know, I, I would also caution, though, that we don't let it become an excuse. Because mm -hmm. there there is a flip side of that where now we use that... Um, and I'm not saying this happens often or um, that a lot of people do it, but there could be a, a, a victimizing right. um, that's used uh, in the church. And so we got to be careful because that can be played out as tokenism mm -hmm. um, where it's like, hey, we just value them because of the color of their skin and you're not actually empowering them to lead in their gifting. Um, that's dangerous for the kingdom. And uh, we do, we need to value diversity and we need to seek diversity um, but not just for the sake of the color of their skin right. without the desire to actually empower them. Because right. um, then what you have is you have a, a white centered model um, and you've just uh, assimilated other people and you've made them act like you. Um, I mean, you've experienced that yeah. before, haven't you? So, yeah, you know, at the same time, were you talking about tokenism um, at the same time as we can't perceive or act on tokenism? Right. We can't also expect. Yeah. Uh, what we think this person of color can That's bring right. just That's because right. of the color of the skin. Because obviously, if people know who I am, I am Asian. Yeah. However, I don't act. I don't act like the majority Asian culture that the world might know. That's right. Because I grew up in the hood. I grew That's up. Right. I grew up next to MS13 and 18th Street, right across the street from each other. Mm. And like you said, the starting point for my journey in ministry. Is different than my other Asian brothers yeah, and sisters in journey. And, and and there's nothing wrong with it. No. But if we're going to continue to build this kingdom culture as you as we're seeing in Revelation 7 9, like you said, everything we celebrate, everything we examine, but then now because of this transforming of Jesus yeah. in our life, we filter everything through that through the gospel. That. That's right. And some of the stuff, it is a gift. But some of the stuff, it is a sin. And we, right. we got to call it out in the That's church right. in a loving way, yeah. right? I wish I can go deeper into this because this is a passion of mine. But you being aware of it as a leader right. of the next and the transition church, and that's where I want to get into, yeah. um, I think that you're building a healthy foundation for other ethnic leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've made, I mean, Light Life has a made way for me. If, if you guys didn't see you know the gifts but also with the learning that i needed to do to fill into my potential i probably be where i am right now it's the same place yeah. miserable but yeah. because nobody's opened the door and the door that's there they're not opening for me anyway wow. and so um so coming here i mean obviously as a as a minority and having that thought of you know the white majority i was thinking and i told larry this too who is this larry white guy that's trying oh, yeah, to pick me up Kansas, you know what i'm saying like you don't right know now. me so <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to check up good. on him like what is he trying to do with me dude but make but um and that's our sin yeah. for perceiving that even yeah and so um if we're going to be continuing to be kingdom minded I think we have to continue to realize and recognize that first, man, we are under God's grace. Mm. Um, and so for you transitioning, and I talked about Larry Walkermeyer, the head pastor of Line Life, who did yeah. great work for the last 30, right? 30 yeah. years yeah. and been a good servant and now going into the next phase of his ministry. Yeah. We're not calling it retirement, no, his ministry. No, no, come on. Um, Man, how is how has that been for you, right? Yeah. As a young emerging head pastor as well, because that's pretty young. Yeah. Yeah, um, one one of the things I'm recognizing too, Paul, is like I, I can't lead like Larry. Mm. You know, I'm I'm not Larry, 
Um, you know, and, and one thing I love, man, about, about the scriptures is like Paul and Timothy's relationship, Mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, Paul was very aware that Timothy was not him. Um, and, but at the same time, he called him to the work that he knew he was supposed to do, um, that he would shy away from. And so what I love about Larry's leadership is Larry recognizes I'm not him. He lets me lead different. But he also recognizes there are areas of legacy, there are areas of growth, there are areas of learning, and he calls them out and he's not afraid to do it. Um, you know, I, I love, uh, I mentioned something I, I taught my, my brother Alexander James, this is something he taught me is he said, hey, Sean, you know, love demands expectation. Um, and so I feel like Larry loves me as a spiritual father because he demands expectation from me, but will also teach me through my failure. It goes back to this model, right? I've learned a lot of it from watching him. Here's what I would say too that's interesting about our transition. Not only is it a team model, so Joel and I are looking to co-pastor together, um, but at the same time, there are not many churches I've seen where a spiritual father passes it off to a spiritual son. Save. I've seen a lot of churches where a biological father, <laughs> you know, I'm not talking about any kind of churches right now, but I kind of am, you know, like uh, a, bio- a biological it. father passes it off to his biological son, yeah. um, you know, and that nepotism yeah. played out, all that. And I've also seen where you've not been, oh man, I, I'll be careful because I don't, I don't want to condemn anyone, but um, you've built such a platform around you that nobody else can stand on it. There's no stairwell to get to where you are. And so you have to go find somebody else that has as big of a platform. Right. And so that's usually what happens in the kingdom. Um, what, what we're looking at is Larry's built a pulpit that we've been standing on with him the entire time. Mm. There's a stairway to get to that pulpit. And so um, what one thing I'm going to lead different in Paul is I, I want to break what I believe is a misnomer in the kingdom. Uh, you know, I think people believe that if you are not the only preacher in the church preaching all the time, that you cannot influence and grow a church. Mm-hmm. Um, at Light and Life, you see a diversity of preachers. You've been preaching from the platform. Right. Susie preaches from the platform. Alex preaches from the platform. Joel, Deb, Larry, myself. When they're preaching, I'm still leading. And I'm still influencing. And so here's my encouragement to people that might be listening, that might be future church planners or leaders, is if your only strategy is the pulpit, you've already lost. If that's your only strategy to raise up and grow the church, listen, there may be a day where you never get to stand in the pulpit again. Can you still be a church planner? Because if you can meet in a home where there's no pulpit, you can be a church planner. If you can love people in your neighborhood, you can be a church planner. And so for me, I, I'm recognizing that one of the dangers of the generation that Larry grew out of was it was all about building your platform, not building your bench. Right. And that's what I want to build. I want to build my bench, bro. Uh, this this is not golf, yeah. right? This this is baseball, yeah. right? Everybody's got a strategic position to play, right. and I want my bench to be super deep. Right. Yeah. Um. I was gonna use a, a a sports analogy, but I know not everybody knows rugby. But one of the <laughs> but one of the greatest teams are, and this is I mean probably some people know this too. But one of the greatest teams are the New Zealand All Blacks. All Blacks, yeah, bro. And come people on. know that team. That's right. And the 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 model for their team is they don't have B side. Everybody is an A side. That's it. And they just rotate. That's it. And so just because you're a starting 15, that doesn't mean you're the best player. That just means they need you for that time. That's right. But once you get replaced, like everybody does because you get tired, mm. the next person that's filling your spot, that's not a B side. That's yeah. another A spot. You know what I mean? Bro, it's- I agree with that. <laughs> hey, for, for people that don't get rugby, just think about Alabama in that's football. Right. Yeah. They're Alabama. deep, bro. Like, right. they, like you're like, where they find these boys, yeah. bro? Like, you go third string deep. Don't matter. They're bro. Third string. They're first string. They're D1. They're, yeah. Like, come on. They're they they're exactly and so i i think that's how i want to build the church is i would rather have a deeper bench a larger roster um than i would a bigger platform i think the greatest lesson i learned here being here for a year and a half is that model of sharing uh well not sharing including people on that platform and so one of my first thing 
uh, as a church planner was, I need to get another leader with me. I don't want to do this by myself. And I know the dangers. I mean, being a third generation pastor's kid, I mean, I know the dangers of that solo act. Uh, when everything relies on you good, and all that pressure, yeah. and not just that pressure, the the uh, the conceitedness that can come with mm-hmm. that platform, right? That's right. Um, and so I just went out and tried to find a good brother, which I have now. Yeah. You know, I have a good brother next to me, keeping yeah. us accountable, both of us. And everywhere I go, I'm trying to bring him with me. Yeah. Um, and wow, so, that's good. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, I've learned many lessons, but I think the the number one lesson that that I haven't seen done well was mm-hmm. this transition slash team model that i'm still trying to work through i mean yeah. i come from the korean church man let's not be let's not be fake let me it. leave bro let me <laughs> you know leave <laughs> there ain't no two pastor kims that's one <laughs> and so that, but man. but i do get it and um obviously with the model that i have i will have more pastors that's right because they're language based and that's so good. i've been in that type of model and Love that. it's rich and, um, and i think yeah. i think you know orig- and at the beginning of this 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 uh recording you talked about a marriage right, right. And I think a, a good ministry is a lot like a good marriage. Um, and I love even what you're doing with this brother that's that's helping you and supporting you. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm always looking for is like, I want to lead with somebody who loves the word just as much as I do. That's right. I want to lead with somebody who loves God just as much as I do. I want to lead with somebody who loves and empower people just as much as I do. They don't have to be as far along as I am, mm-hmm. but they got to love it as much. And, and that's a lot like marriage, right? Um, I, I'll say this. Be careful when you're building a team model of unequal yoking because uh, it happens in marriage, um, but it also happens in ministry. And that's how a lot of church splits happen. That's how marriage is splits too. Bro, you it's, look at somebody for crushed. their gifting, not for what they actually love. Mm. And that's what I love about you, yeah. Paul, is like you're always searching people going like, yeah, man, he's really good at that. But like, I don't know, man. I don't hear him talking about Jesus <laughs> yeah, very much, yeah, yeah. you know. And so that always gets yeah. me excited because I think the brother you're partnering with, I look at that and I go, this dude loves Jesus and the name of Jesus just as much as yeah. you do. And that's equal yokeness. I think that's going to help you get along farther because now you got multiplied horsepower in that direction. You know, thanks for this wonderful conversation. As we come to a close, man, what's your, um, and I ask this to everybody, what's your hopes and dreams? And I mean, the way you, I mean, we've talked about it, the way you're modeling the future church of micro entrepreneur and yeah. all this stuff that I'm like, can we do this in the church? You know, but but you are you are breaking the mold, and I'm trying to follow right behind, grab some type of coattail like everybody else. Uh, what's your what's your hope and future of the church, if you can say? That's good, man. I think number one, geographic saturation. Um, In Long Beach, there are about 300 faith, Bible-believing communities, and there are almost 500,000 people. There are not enough churches to see people churched. Um, And so for me, it's geographic saturation. If we can put down competition, the church will grow. If we're not worried about how close the next church is um, and we all play our lanes, um, it'll become a super highway, and a lot of people will come onto this road. Um, That's number one for me. And then I, I think number two is cultural multiplication. You know, one one thing I would love to see is for us to redeem the culture and not have a a mindset of cultural protectionism, but rather cultural engagement through the lens of the gospel. Not to become like the culture, but to redeem it for the glory of God. Um, This generation, in my opinion, has lost a lot of that. We want to be like the world so bad that the church often looks more like the world um, than the world does. Man, I've seen very like like Christian things happen mm. in very non-Christian settings. Right. And I've seen some very ungodly things happen in churches. Mm. And when I look at that, what I recognize is that there's a redemptive work that God needs to do in this generation. Um, I think we've bought into a type of I- idolatry and, and religion Um, that's made us a lot more like the Pharisees than we think we are. And so I think if we could see gospel saturation and, um, you know, this cultural multiplication, I think we could redeem the work. Um, An example is um, like anybody out there, if you work in like parachurch ministry, um, can I just ask you to start doing one thing? Like don't make kids hold out to hear the gospel before you feed them, feed them and then let them hear the gospel. Um, you know, one thing we we don't do well as the church is 
We have forgotten our history of meeting immediate needs so that we can grow people to their eternal destiny. And so I want to get back to that. I want to remind people like you can make a difference right now. And I love what you're doing, Paul, like food distribution, things like that, man. It is hard to hear the gospel on an empty stomach. Now, I'm not saying like just go in and preach the gospel through your actions. You have to use your words, right? That's a dangerous saying that we have in the church. Um, Because the tongue, the Bible says, has the power to give life and to destroy. But let our actions match our words. Mm -hmm. And I think if we live in that, we can see a revival. And I mean like real revival. Because, you know, when we talk about revival, we're like, oh, Lord, you know, spiritual experience. (laughs) Bro, you ever seen somebody that had a heart attack get revived? Mm -hmm. Boom, the paddles hit you. There's going to be some shocking if we want revival, renewal, restoration. And so... We got to lay down competition. We got to be willing to redeem the culture. And I think God could revive and restore and renew this generation. That's right. Hey, where can we find you? Where can we find the church? And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I, I would say find the church, not just right. me, but you go to llcf.org, uh, Light and Life Christian Fellowship, llcf.org, um, or all of our social media is llcflb, Light and Life Christian Fellowship, Long Beach, uh, just llcflb. Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Um, see what God's doing here because it's not about me. It's about the work of God and, and what Christ is doing in our community. And um, I'm excited about it, man. If anybody has any questions, uh, they can hit you up. And then if you decide <laughs> yeah. it's good, then I'm let me know. I'm going to vent first. <laughs> I'm going to see, eh, they're cool, but eh, you might want to check like up it. on your Jesus loving first. <laughs> Hey, listen, thanks a lot for just having this conversation with me. I think it's important for people to know how church planting happens. It just doesn't happen out of the blue. And if it does, man, God did some crazy work. But everybody's part of it. Everybody supports. Everybody's a player. And I'm so grateful for, you know, guys like you. And this is where it started from. You know, this is where my journey started from church planting. And I got to know everybody else outside of that. Sean, you're a huge influence. And just lot, and just giving me that space and taking me places as well yeah. to see you know other parts of what the kingdom is doing you know mm-hmm. and not just my own small whatever mind and I'm always open to learn and listen so are you you know yeah. I think and 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 so having that type of partnership and conversation is gonna we're trying to build healthy churches that's, that's our goal and, and and in order to do that we got to be healthy first that's it. and the way we do that is going towards Come Jesus on, so thanks man. a lot Sean for this wonderful conversation yeah. and uh, at the time of this. Uh, time of this podcast it's march of 2021 light and life is open outdoors yes right so we'll see where we go from there hopefully i mean there's some states that's wide open but we'll see what what happens in all of it bro all right man god bless y'all thanks a lot